everyone. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and get started. So if you can uh, find a seat or if you're coming in. Uh, we, we only have uh, 35 minutes here, so we've got five panelists and we're going to try to get through this quickly. So first, we're going to do a round of introductions. Um, and then we're going to get into the panel. So if anyone wants to take a minute to introduce themselves. Hello, everyone. I'm Tanim Ibrahim. I'm a senior engineering manager at Red Hat OpenShift AI engineering team. My team works in uh, KSurf community, Kubeflow community. Uh, we also work in uh, Trusty AI and model registry. So those are the aspects uh, we are working pretty closely. Pass it on to you. Tess. Oh. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Tessa Pham. I'm a senior software engineer on the AI inference team at Bloomberg, and I'm also a contributor of KSurf. Um, my team works on building out and maintaining the inference platform for Bloomberg's data scientists and engineers. And our TL, our team lead, Dan Sun, uh, co-founded KSERV back in 2019. And since then, as a team, we have made contributions to KSERV as well as integrated it into the inference platform um, and other internal projects. And um, yeah, that's it for me. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Jonu George, uh, Technical Director in Nutanix AI Org. Uh, so uh, uh, I wear two hats in Nutanix uh, day to day life. I lead all AI activities uh, within Nutanix. In open source, um, I lead a couple of ML communities, uh, Kubeflow, ML Commons. Uh, if you are not aware, Kubeflow is ML Ops platform on Kubernetes. Uh, I am part of the Kubeflow Steering Committee. Uh, in our ML Commons, we co-founded uh, ML Commons Storage Working Group, which is looking at the storage impact of ML, work to, uh, ML workloads during ML training. Thank you. I have a mic. So I'm Andrea Montano. I'm AML Product Manager at Canonical, the publisher of Ubuntu. And I work, I look after our AML portfolio, which includes Kubeflow, KServe that has already been mentioned, as well as a couple of other tools, such as ML Flow, for example, as well as Data Science Stack that's designed to help developers get started very quickly on an Ubuntu workstation. Yep, and uh, I'm Adam Tittleman. I'm a principal product architect from NVIDIA. Uh, I haven't, haven't contributed to nearly as many projects as the other uh, folks on the panel here, but I've, I've been using all of them for uh, many, many years now. So I, I use uh, Kubeflow, I use KServe, and all of the dependent projects on it. And uh, the reason we're doing this panel is because recently NVIDIA uh, launched a new AI application product and I thought that the best way to get it to market and get it in front of people was to make sure it worked really well on KServe and the open source project. So I've, I've been working with, with everyone on here very closely to make that happen. And uh, this panel is sort of just a journey of what is it like to do things in the open source with the community. Uh, so the first thing we want to talk about in this panel, uh, sort of going off of that, is, is what, what is the current state and uh, the, the question, I think we're going to go uh, this way here. So the question for you, Andrea. Uh, what, what has your experience been uh, working with me and working with the community? What, what challenges have you faced? What accomplishments have you faced? And, and particularly in the realm of AI, LLMs, Gen AI, a lot of this new stuff coming out, what, what has the benefit been to you, your company, and, and the, the customers that you work with? I'll I've been active in the open source uh, for quite some time now. And if I look back, the biggest challenge that I had initially was how to get started, especially if you want to contribute. How do you actually contribute? It feels that there are a lot of very good developers. But everyone has and knows what they need to do and how to do things. Um, so that was the initial challenge on how to get started to be a contributor within one community. And that's something that I've noticed a lot of the Kubeflow of, or the new joiners in Kubeflow struggle with as well, especially since it's it's a large platform. It's it's not there very easy to get started with initially, so it's often intimidating. Um, and that's where I think I've enjoyed working with other developers, and I enjoyed working especially with people who are getting started in the ML, ML space as well as in the open source space to lower the barrier entry to help them really feel comfortable raising bugs, solving issues, asking questions, improving documentation, all the small things that you can do. And furthermore, also writing projects. I think that having such a powerful platform as Kubeflow without projects that can help you get started, build your first model, fine tune an LLM, or run names together with KServe and Kubeflow, those are the things that are just lowering the barrier engine helps people get started. 
Right. I, myself, I was uh, part of Keso from the very, very start. Um, so I'm so glad to see this community grow from uh, very few folks to this scale. Right. And uh, thanks to all developers, it's all started with training TensorFlow models um, in Kubeflow to serving same TensorFlow model using TF serving. So from that, it has grown to uh, a big, big framework which can do all these large language models at scale uh, in any infra, right? So um, I'm uh, uh, recently we announced at Nutanix Enterprise AI, which has um, case of at its core uh, to to provide a one-click deployment of large language models of your choice, right? Uh, at scale, without knowing anything about the underlying system infra. So this is not possible without a project like this, where it, it is a group work that we have done as part of the case of community. So if you really think about case of, it, it is a it is a it's a group of Lego blocks together, right? Like many things come in together, people contribute different items, and then it gets into a single project. So the all the different blocks, if you really see the front-facing uh, API, which is part of the Open Inference Protocol. So we, for uh, reason, we have put that outside case serve because we wanted inference protocol to be used by other communities as well. So for example, right, a torch serve, uh, NVIDIA Triton, everyone uses the same inference protocol, right? And case of implements exactly the same, right? Now the next tell is the, about the inference runtimes where users can bring any runtime of your choice and plug it into case serve without uh, any code change, right? Be it NVIDIA NIM, TGI, or VLLM, of, or any runtime of your choice without, it is just by having a YAML, you have your uh, runtime added to Keso. And the, at the end, the same, the whole stack can be run on any hardware, right? Be it GPUs, be it uh, CPUs, AMX accelerated, or AMD GPUs, whatever it is, right? So in a way, it is, it is a group project, it is, it's a community product, which can bring all these Lego blocks together, which is the core strength of Keso. Well, thanks, John. Um, I would like to start off by just speaking from my personal experience. So I made my first contribution to Keso back in 2022, when I shortly after I joined the Infants team at Bloomberg. And what I found from multiple PRs that I've contributed to Keso is that the whole process is Pleasantly, I was pleasantly surprised by how easy it was to make contributions and for the contribution to count towards um, like the work that I do internally and also help other people at other companies who are facing the same problems. Um, and it's super easy to just identify issues because we all are here and we all know that there are a lot of common challenges and we're all trying to tackle. Um, and it's very easy to raise issues and come up with your own solutions propose it to the wider KSERF community and get your PR uh, reviewed, uh, get feedback, and get it merged. And then the moment that your change is in, then that will solve the issue for your enterprise products, solve the issue for many people out there that you don't even know. So I think that is the strength of the open source community um, that I have experienced like personally. Um, and talking about the the unique benefits of being in the open source community, they are countless. And you've got to start first by uh, recognizing that all of this comes to us for free. And this, we are getting the quickest crowdsourced solution at no cost um, and from the wider community. And that's like the very first benefit that you don't get from an enterprise product where you have to pay and it's vendorized. Um, and the second thing is once you get involved in the open source community, you will see that there are so many collaborations going on, a lot of innovations every day, people coming up with solutions, people coming together to discuss things. And what's even cooler is that you are collaborating with people from across companies that you have never met before and you don't get, to you don't get the chance to work with if you just work within your company. Um, and uh, finally, just leveraging the resource of the wider community and the strength of uh, people coming together for nothing else but wanting to find solutions to the problems that they are facing and also other people are facing, um, you will find much 
um, quicker solutions and more efficient. Um, and yeah, as you give back to the community, you also get back the same. Um, so that, those are the uh, very unique um, benefits that anyone would get from open source, you know, be it like inference AI or anything open source. Um, but at the same time, we also have to, have to recognize the challenges um, in this. And I want to talk about challenges that are specific to AI. So aside from all the challenges that we all face here um, with the boom of LLMs in the recent years and the models is getting bigger and bigger, we all want to optimize resources and, um, and time, model startup time, and all of that. Um, and uh, as a community, we all work together and are working on solutions and designing solutions to tackle those problems. But as uh, for KSurf specifically, um, in order to make the project great, we actually have to tackle all of these areas all together. And each of these areas requires a lot of deep expertise. Um, and that's why every day we're working with different companies, different partners, and other projects to make these solutions um, happen. So yeah, that's my experience. Thank you, Tess. Uh, so speaking of, like Tess was alluding to, community collaboration, power of open source, right? So if you think about the WG serving community that we have started recently, uh, one of the big recent success is more than 250 members have joined that community. So this is an umbrella project to tackle the, the challenges that LLM inferencing brings, and how do we solve it in a cloud-native way in Kubernetes, working across many, many, many companies, right? So it's a big, big, happy family. Uh, another interesting uh, area out of that is, uh, is the gateway project that is um, um, our friends from Bloomberg and others have been uh, contributing closely. Because one of the challenges we face with large models is also uh, being able to route them efficiently. How do you know which model you want to route to? Sometimes you can have SLOs like cost. You may, some models may work really well with inferencing. Some, some models may, may work really well with CPUs. Some models may work really well with GPUs. And so you have different types of um, accelerators that you need to know. And the LLM Instance Gateway Project that uh, we are working closely with KSERF community together is one way to help solve that, right? Um, there's uh, all kinds of newer metrics that you have to think for from language models. So if you come from traditional predictive ML model lifecycle, you normally you have CPU request, uh, you have uh, how many threads are being hit. Those are the common uh, metrics you look at. But when it comes to language models, you have to think of like KV cache utilization. You have to think of batch size, number of tokens being queued. All those type of uh, metrics are new to the space for model serving or inferencing workload, right? So we're using the same set of tools that are already there in Kubernetes ecosystem, but we are implementing them for a new type of workload uh, and doing it at scale. Um, and I would also say like another really cool success story recently was uh, one of the projects uh, we at Red Hat have been working closely on is Trusty AI, and uh, responsible AI concepts. So KSERF has an uh, implementation called Explain, so, um, where you can actually hook up a explainer model to a KSERF endpoint and actually be able to run various um, responsible AI algorithms like Lime, Shap, Counterfactuals to explain that. Uh, so we are working on adding those types of uh, um, uh, uh, algorithms for large language models, as well as for different types of evaluation, like LM eval, so that you can actually evaluate your model really well. So currently that works with VLM, with KSERF uh, together. Uh, so that has been a really interesting project to work on, because uh, for example, if, you, if the models are getting bigger and bigger, but how do you know if your model is actually doing a good job? Like just because you have a 405 billion parameter model doesn't mean that the model is going to perform what you need for your work. Your work may require very domain specific tasks. Maybe you are a service company who has support cases, right? And you want to do a case summarization. Uh, and you may not need a model that size. So LMEval like tools can help you evaluate those models for you, your specific use cases using LM harness toolkits. So that has been a really good success story. Um, I would also say like the recently the community got together on um, how do we support really, really large models with uh, stateful uh, pods um, and, and, and working across uh, the various uh, implementations. We have looked at leader work set, we have looked at stateless deployments, we have looked at stateful pod sets, and how do we actually make sure that these models can be deployed across multiple nodes? Because some of these large models obviously doesn't fit in one node anymore. 
Uh, that is, has been a really interesting challenge that I, um, the community collaboratively worked on to solve, and the PR recently got marched as well. Th thank you for that. Yeah, and I, I uh, kind of to, to your uh, point, Tess, I, I remember um, before I was really deeply in the community, I was uh, using, using tools, using Kubeflow, and it must have been fi five or six years ago uh, when I was trying to teach people how to, to use DGX and do uh, training of a big BERT model. And uh, Jupyter wasn't enough because I needed to do pipelines. And having Kubeflow, a, a thing I could just go to, and it sort of did everything. And, and I, I was able to make a workshop in like a week that showed people how to train an LLM. Now, that was back, back then when you know, we, LLMs weren't quite as big then. And, so, and sort of on the personal note, it's it, getting into this, like getting to know all of you, it's been fun. It's been fun for me. I'm not just uh, working with the folks from my company, but I'm working with the folks from a lot of other companies, and that, that there's some fun to that. And then there's, there's sort of a sharing of ideas, right? So like I, I see my world and what I'm doing, but, but when I'm in a meeting with, with Red Hat or Canonical or Nutanix or Bloomberg, I'm, I'm learning that you see the world in a slightly different way, and all of those ways are valid. And uh, sort of sharing of ideas, we end up uh, addressing kind of, I think you, you guys were both alluding to, there's a whole lot of use cases out there, and we need to solve all of them for someone. And some of them, I didn't realize they were problems until you, you, you showed them to me when, when you were going through the solutions. And then I realized, oh yeah, caching at this layer is gonna be hugely important for me in three months or six months for me, but, but you're already two months into solving, and I sort of piggyback off of it. Uh, so, so it's been a, a, a big win there. I think on the product side, right, uh, so I, NVIDIA came out with NVIDIA NIM on like March and it was like our new AI product and uh, when we were first running it, it was a Docker run and then someone realized we needed to deploy it into production and so we built a Helm chart for it and then when we go to, go to our customers, they're like, that's great, this is a Helm chart, but I'm using this platform or I'm using this platform or I'm using this platform and and that Helm chart isn't production ready. I care about more than just the application. I care about all of these platform level features. And me, like the thing I'm working on is an application. I don't want to have to care about those platform features. Those uh, I want. I want to plug into them, but I don't want to, to implement all of them. And then, lucky for me, there's there's a whole community of people who are implementing them in different ways. And my customers are already your customers. So. So going into the KServe community, working with you to implement API standards around LLMs, to implement um, security and some of the caching things we've been working on. And then uh, I, did, I did some work w with Red Hat. We were initially, we were doing the initial POC to get uh, NIM working on KServe and, and OpenShift AI. And then uh, it worked on Nutanix AI and on uh, the Charm, Charm Kubernetes and all of the other platforms. And so it, it sort of just worked. Now we're all benefiting from that. I'm benefiting, you're benefiting, all of our joint customers are benefiting. And so that kind of doing it with the open source community saved me a whole lot of time and then ended up being, well, fun uh, and win-win-win for, 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 for everyone. So I've really enjoyed it. I've really appreciated it. I, I think uh, it, it, it's, been a good, it's been a good thing. And just want to add, all these building blocks that Adam was talking about, were defined by community themselves, right? Yeah. It's all community ask and community features. They con it's contributed by community itself. Yeah, yeah, it's all, all on GitHub. And um, the, the fun thing is we're not done, right? So you, you talked about work group serving. We have that now. And uh, I looked at uh, some of the meeting notes, and there's a big list of AIs. There's all of these new projects that are coming out. But these projects have a new list of feature requests. We, we have a lot of problems to solve. And as a community, I think we need to come together because just looking around in KubeCon, I hear people talking about how they're solving the same thing over and over and over again in different ways. And everyone wants to come together and solve it once so we can all benefit. So sort of with that in mind, uh, maybe going the, the other direction, what, um, what future things uh, are you excited about in open source? Are, are there any specific roadmap items that you'd like to talk about, any challenges that you're you're excited and anxious about, uh, and anything uh, maybe in like the LLM Gen AI space that that you like to talk about. And mo more importantly, um, how can people get involved? How can we help? Because we're we're all the community here, so everyone in this room can can be on the panel next year to talk about how how they had a big win that, that helped everyone else. Awesome, thanks, Adam. Uh, it's a great question. So, uh, talking about WG serving, we need people. Uh, there, uh, we have a lot of projects undertaking. If you uh, if you're on the CNCF Slack, which I hope you all are, there's a WG serving channel. Join the channel. The moment you join the channel, you'll you'll see a bunch of uh, sub 
working groups, under the working groups, uh, but from topics like LM Instance Gateway, prompt ca um, LM Cache Project, which is basically caching of prompts. Uh, there is a project around uh, performance benchmarks, so standardizing how you um, uh, standardize the performance benchmarks for different LLMs and different runtimes that supports those LLM model deployments. And there's a, a subcommittee around security if you're interested in that area. There's a, all kinds of fun, exciting things that are happening, and it can only happen, back to your news point, if we get community to help us. Uh, there's only a really, there's so much work there to do and so few people involved and so few, and so scaling is gonna be critical for us to do this. Like what I want to see personally, maybe next year, we're talking not about how we make inferencing work with KSER, we're talking a layer above, how we're applying agentic LLM frameworks orchestration with KSER, right? Uh, because inferencing, inference optimization, maybe we have gotten that problem solved to an extent where that is no longer a concern that we have to deal with, right? So in order to get there, we need a lot of support, a lot of help from everyone in the room and spread the word, get to WG Serving channel, get to the KSERV channel, help us um, join the community. Uh, so in terms of what I'm excited about red ma uh, roadmap wise, so um, I'm really excited about uh, uh, another project which is not exactly directly under, under WG Serving, it's under WG uh, Batch uh, slash WG Device, is the DRA project, which is a dynamic resource allocator. Uh, so if you're not familiar, it just allows you to uh, allocate GPUs for your pods in a claim way, like, like how you do PVC claims for storage. Think of that kind of same concept, but for GPUs. Now, the fun thing, or, or, or any accelerator really, um, and, and the fun part about that is that you can actually utilize fractional GPUs. So maybe your model is like a two billion parameter model or one billion parameter model because it's a very specialized model. And you may not need the entire GPU to be consumed for that, right? So DRA allows you to uh, slice the um, GPUs in a way where you can actually allocate based on what you need, the fraction you need, right? And then on top of that is another project that has recently launched is the Insta Slice, which allows you to do just in time GPU slicing um, on top of the DRA. So you have DRA underneath, InstaSlice is on top, makes that uh, provisioning for DRA much, much simpler and easier. So I'm really excited to see that because I think once we have that project uh, get to stable status, uh, and then we have KServe on top of it, and we can work with the VLM community closely to see how we can allow the developers who are using KServe today to allocate um, slab those fractional GPUs for their models they're deploying through KSERV. Uh, that, that is a really exciting project I'm looking forward to, and I'm also looking forward to how the LM Gateway project revolves around. I think that's gonna be a massive um, topic for all of us. Uh, once we get that figured out and how that routing works through KSERV and have a, a abstraction layer on top, that would also make the inference optimization process uh, really, really uh, efficient. Pass it on to Tess. Uh, thanks, Tanim. I think Tanim really set the right theme for, uh, for this question. Um, and speaking more specifically about KServe, um, the common theme right now that we're tackling is how to reduce cost, how to reduce serving cost and make it more efficient. And that's what all the infant servers are, um, LM infant servers are trying to tackle right now. And there's all these buzz about around GPU fraction um, uh, and uh, GPU time slicing. People are trying to find different solutions. Right. And uh, on the KSERV side, uh, we are we do have uh, multiple solutions that are currently underway or in progress uh, or in design. Um, one of which is um, I, I can name a few so uh, we can uh, get excited for um, and those are new features that we'll be introducing to KSERV in within probably the next year. Um, the first thing is uh, we want to, as these models are, all the LM models are getting bigger and bigger, we need to reduce the model start time. We need to reduce the latency. And uh, for that, we have uh, a design proposed for model caching. And, um, and it is currently in progress right now. Um, we have a couple team members from Bloomberg as well as uh, other companies working on this. Um, and auto scaling is another feature that uh, the KSER community has been working very closely with CADA, the CADA community, um, Kubernetes-based 
uh, event-driven autoscaler. So this is how we are leveraging all the expertise from other areas, uh, other communities to um, come together and uh, provide with the users out there with the best solution. Um, but yeah, so KServe is uh, working very closely with Keda to um, implement this uh, autoscaler feature. Um, and, uh, yeah, and another thing uh, too is if you were at the keynote uh, this morning, um, and also Tanim just mentioned, uh, is the AI gateway, and um, it's also an exciting feature that we look forward to, um, that we want to uh, have uh, the AI gateway that is more efficient for MML, uh, for LM uh, workloads. Um, yeah, so those are some projects that are currently underway, and we really do need people. Um, it's very exciting. You will be working with um, experts from multiple different fields, and uh, yeah, and it's, a, it's an exciting time to be working on inference stuff right now. Um, and looking forward to, um, we are also, uh, we want to tackle the challenge of prom caching. Um, a lot of people are talking about prom caching uh, at this conference as well, and uh, that is something that we are starting to design a solution for. Um, and uh, yeah, and overall, uh, for the KSERF community, so those are just uh, some exciting features and enhancements to KSERF and infant services that we want to give you a sneak peek, a sneak peek of. Um, but overall, uh, as a community, we really hope to get more people involved in the community. Um, again, it is a growing community. We have so many big companies that are getting involved right now. Um, we want to get even more companies involved in order to align on protocols together and all the companies to adopt these common protocols so that, um, yeah, so that everything can work for everyone. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just obviously we also uh, face challenges. Um, for example, as different companies come together, we all have different priorities and if we just show up to these community meetings and talk about uh, all the needs and requirements from, um, yeah, from everyone, then we can find the right resources to work on these uh, different work streams. Um, yeah, and yeah, and finally, just uh, yeah, just try to get involved in open source um, and uh, yeah, and I don't know, we ha we have a lot of exciting projects um, to to work on, so. A lot of projects, it's a recurring theme here. Yeah. <laughs> yes, um, so uh, about the future. So KSF is really good at all traditional predictive models. So in the, for the last one year, we are trying to pivot to generative model space, right? So uh, if you really look at all the traditional models, like it is all working with the request-based auto-scaling and request-based metrics. Uh, it works really well for the traditional models, but in large language models, due to its size, scale, and architecture, it is not that easy um, because of many reasons, right? Um, so if you really look at in the large language models, like you get uh, a request of 100 tokens now, in the next instant, you can get a request of 10,000 tokens, right? So uh, GPU can take like uh, 10 milliseconds for the first request, the other one can actually take seconds to minutes. So the auto-scaling, and uh, the other uh, the factors which are deciding auto scaling uh, are not that easy in the LLM world, right? Specifically in the generative AI world. So, in other words, we need to have tokens as the first class citizen for the large language models in the newer space. So, we are we are discussing internally as well, like how can we integrate token based auto scaling and token based metrics. Uh, for having much more uh, guaranteed SLAs for throughput and latency in case of, and that's one major focus. And similar to the other standards that we are looking for, again, for a, a common unified metric interface, right? Like for different runtimes provide different metrics, uh, be it name, VLLM. So we need a unified metric interface similar to how we have in inference protocol. Uh, which can decide what's the performance of a uh, runtime and how can we decide auto scaling based on that, right? In case of community, as a community, we can come together and decide what are the right abstractions that we need to do, even from the metrics and the auto scaling part, 
and that can work with all different runtimes underneath. So from a user perspective, he doesn't need to know anything. From He just uses the standard OpenAI protocol. Um, uh, sorry, the Open Inference protocol. And the rest of all things are handled by the case of uh, internally. Thank you. I think a lot of the interesting projects and features have been already mentioned. But adding to what Anim said, also, it's worth mentioning that it's important for us as a community to share your experience with a project or with a product. If you've been using KSERF, Kubeflow, or any other tool, share it with us how it has been, what were the blockers that you faced as well, because that's how we end up coming with features, with ideas, with projects, with roadmaps at the end of the day. And one of the reasons why personally I love coming to KubeCon is whether we talk about Charm Kubeflow or KSERF or Kubeflow, the upstream project, I really enjoy hearing how people use it, what are the challenges that they have, because it gives us food for thought on how can we make it better. Now, looking at the future, there are, I think, two things that were not necessarily mentioned yet. On one hand, we are going to need to focus more on security, whether we talk about the security of the packages that are being used uh, in case or in general in, in the projects um, that are used for data science and machine learning, is one aspect that needs to be prioritized in order to be able to roll out a lot of the projects in production. And then on the other hand, improving the user experience and lowering the barrier entry to run Gen AI models, uh, Gen AI projects and LLMs is going to be another one. Last but not least, if I go back to the security idea, uh, what excites me very much is to run Kubeflow and then probably KServe as well at some point in confidential computing VMs is something that is going to enable collaboration at a whole different scale between companies within the same industry, which I think is exciting as well. Adam, I think you still have some minutes as well to add some things. Yeah, uh, so, so yeah, so to sort of pull that all together, I know you guys mentioned a lot of the, the API gateways, uh, new features, like th these are all new things and roadmaps I'm excited for. So sort of to add to that a little bit, uh, maybe ro roll it back. Uh, I, I think I'm up here because we, we had a win, and one of the, the things getting here that was really difficult, that completely different topic, convincing people internally that open source was a good path. Uh, I, I really had to champion KServe as a useful platform. I really had to pitch to product people and engineering leaders. I need to go to them and say, hey, this is important. We need to put resources on it. Uh, and I'm really looking to the future, seeing that we're all here, uh, seeing that people are, are, are receptive, and that now my customers have choice of platform, choice of models, choice of AI, and it's, it's just giving more to the community. I, I think that's a win that will make it easier for me to go back to upper leadership and saying, hey, let, let's do this more. It worked last time. Uh, we all won together. Let's, let's do it again. And, and so I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing more engagement. I know Chris Lamb gave a, a, a keynote uh, uh, yesterday, and I'm, I'm hoping to get more folks from my teams involved in more projects, uh, which is good, because the other thing I wanted to mention is there's a lot of new stuff that, that we need to get into the open source. You mentioned confidential containers. Uh, that's, that's a hardware-dependent thing, and it's going to require a lot of software to make work. Uh, I think uh, you mentioned multi-node inferencing. We, we have the first pass of that out now. but that's another uh, hardware-dependent thing, and there's a lot of things that, that my, my teams can work on around high-performance networking and high-performance uh, uh, fabric that we can make the multi-node stuff go faster. We can, we can make the, the time slice stuff go faster. So I'm excited to see, and, and DRA, right? that, that's a part of that story. So I'm excited to see a lot of that stuff come together so that the applications, which are getting more complex, can get simpler to manage and uh, more efficient. And so, so sort of the last thing, uh, generative AI applications are getting more complex. There's all of these pieces. Uh, we were here, right, with the platform where we have a single inference server doing a single model and then model mesh so we could do multiple models and mix it. And now we need something completely new because now we have these generative AI applications with RAG and we, we have to, we're defining telemetry standards in some working groups and we're defining these new gateways in other working groups. And so there's really... Uh, this community, the working group serving community, is really across a bunch of different projects, and, and we're all trying to figure out what the problems are right now. And, and this is a great time to get involved, because I think we're, we're, we're just getting a grasp of all of the problems, and we're, we're starting to put solutions together. Um, so, so I think we have time for one question. Do we want to take a, or does anyone on the panel? There is uh, one. We've got one. one uh, okay.
Sure. Yep. So, so the question was, what sort of skill set do you need to get in, involved in this sort of work? ML ops engineering, Python, CUDA, good at one thing, bad at another. What, what do you need? Um, if I may start, um, I think it really depends. But for example, in the Kubeflow community, I see a lot of students who are just very good Python engineers, very enthusiastic, very curious. Um, and they just get started. They, they learn as they go. And that can be challenging, but at the same time, it gives you a lot of satisfaction. At the same time, I think understanding Kubernetes is a foundational piece that is going to lower your barrier entry when it comes to KServe, and is going to accelerate the way you can contribute. I see Tanim is, is agreeing. I'm not sure. Would you like to add something? No, no, no. Go for it. Sorry. No. I just want to take one example. <laughs> Some of my team members were completely new to Kubernetes and KServe two years ago. They are currently reviewers of Keso project, right? So it's all driven by interest and the amount of effort which are putting in. And Keso community is welcoming uh, everyone, each and everyone. Uh, I would say having technical skills is obviously really helpful to contribute, whether you're a Python developer, Go developer, or you're an MLOps engineer. But there's a lot of help we need, even documentation updating. If you go to the KSERV website, there are a lot of new features that we have not been able to add to the documents, right? And that's one of the first place where a new, new user would come and use KSERV, that's where they're going to go. So even if you can contribute by updating our documentation, that is a massive contribution. So I would say like it's, it's all about working in the community, it's all about putting the time in. Uh, and, and that's how you contribute and help. So if you don't feel like an I don't know Go, I don't know ML, I mean, how do I go contribute? It really doesn't matter. Uh, you can contribute in all kinds of ways. We welcome all kinds of contributions. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, I think Kubernetes is definitely the, the base. Uh, as long as you're familiar with pods and containers, I think you're pretty much set to go. Um, and it, yeah, it doesn't matter what programming language you know. Um, and a lot of people from like come from you know end users of of all these technologies to become uh, contributors of open source projects. So you really can start from anywhere as long as you know the uh, what the what problem we're trying to solve and or yeah, just even just raise an issue. That's a contribution. So. Yeah. yeah, so I think you, you need a passion to, to want to help, and we'll help you learn the rest, is what I just heard. <laughs> I think, uh, I think we're, we're at time here. So uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, I hope you have a good conference.